He is risen. Amen. Amen. Well, wonderful, wonderful to be here on this Easter Sunday. We had a wonderful time this morning watching the sunrise come up. It was beautiful for the first time. I don't know how many years, young people, how many years since we've seen the actual sun <laughs> rise. Oh, okay. The first time in two years we've seen the sun. I thought it was longer, but there you have it. Two years. We saw the, we saw the sun this morning. It was very beautiful. I tried to set up my phone for a time lapse to show you guys, and it utterly failed. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> but it was wonderful to be there this morning, have breakfast with uh, the young people. And uh, they've already been here for church for hours. So there you go. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I want to uh, start by just talking a little bit about what we've been doing, because this is a wonderful celebration this Sunday, but for those of us who call this church our home, I don't, if you're visiting, uh, you'll realize we've been looking forward to Easter for a long time already. We've been anticipating this day for quite some time, because we've been uh, each week learning and reflecting on the cross, and specifically the statements of Jesus that he said from the cross. Um, we've been studying that for the past six weeks, the entire series of Lent, we've been reading in the Gospel of John for devotionals. We've been interceding for the church in prayer on Wednesday nights. And so it's been an incredible journey, actually, leading up to this Resurrection Sunday and uh, listening and learning from Jesus on the cross. Because as it turns out, uh, Jesus wasn't silently hanging on the cross. Uh, Roman uh, crucifixion was a form of execution designed to be drawn out. And so there was time. And Jesus used that time as he was dying to preach, to pray, to minister to those next to him. And he said some very profound things, and these are profound encounters from the cross. And today, I'm going to be sharing uh, the last one with you. We're going to be looking at that this morning. But let's, let's see if we can remember uh, the sayings, all seven sayings, the number of completion from the cross. So who knows what the first one was? Or maybe we don't even have to do them in order. Let's see if we can get them. I thirst, I thirst that's one. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. My God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, behold your mother, behold your son. That's Jesus says to uh, John, and he's taking care of his mother. Behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. It is finished, and today you'll be with me in paradise. Yes, he says to the criminal who's dying right next to him. And that leaves the last one for today, which they may already... Oh, they didn't have it up on the screen. Nicely done, Cole. Who knows the last one? Uh, we already said that one. Who said? So, that's right. I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that's what we're looking at today. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. And so you can turn to your Bibles, but I'm going to start with an illustration. But it's going to take me a little bit to get set up here. So uh, bear with me, and you can open your Bibles in the meantime. to do, what we're going to do is I'm going to, we're going to play a guess the song. <laughs> I'm going to play for you guys a hymn, and I want you to see if you can recognize what it is. And I've chosen a fairly common hymn, and there's a reason I chose it, but even if you had not really gone to church, or you don't really go to church, chances are you've heard it. And so see if you can recognize the name of the song, and I'm going to tell you why it's important afterwards. But I'm going to play it on my violin. I'm going to attempt a string quartet for you on my own. So we'll see how this goes.
it's, a, it's about the best I can do on my own for you guys. I was replicating a historical event. So first, um, who, if, rec, raise your hand if you recognize a song, even if you don't know the name, if you can't place where it is, lots of people recognize the tune. Okay, now raise your hand if you know the name of the song. And okay, there's a lot of people that do. So what, what is the hymn? Nearer my God to thee. Yes, very famous hymn. But what, what event in history made that song extremely famous, which I was trying to replicate on my, by myself? Does anybody know? Yes? That's right, it's the Titanic. The Titanic made this song famous. So there's some, somebody said, at least in the movie. Well, actually, the movie's based on the real event that happened in terms of, uh, that was a James Cameron movie. They play that song. But historically, uh, witnesses who were there, people who survived the Titanic sinking, uh, remember that song being played. Because as the story goes, and if you've seen the movie, uh, this, this, the band for the Titanic, they play music to the very end when the ship is sinking, to the very end, and they play this song, Near My God to Thee. But there's a, there's a story behind that, behind the request for the song, because it turns out, on the Titanic that night, there was a young pastor from Scotland, and his name was John Harper. Um, and he, you can look up his story, there's pictures of him online. Uh, but he had been ministering in a church in the States, Moody, uh, Moody Church in Chicago, actually, is where he had been serving. And he had gone back for a visit to England, uh, to Scotland rather, and then he was making his way back to the States where he'd be serving a, another stunt, uh, stint in Chicago. And he was traveling there with his six-year-old daughter, Nana, on the Titanic. And so when the Titanic hit the iceberg on April 14th, 1912, John Harper realized the ship was sinking, so he brought his daughter on deck, he wrapped her in a blanket, and told her that she would see him again one day and safely loaded her onto a lifeboat. And she survived. Uh, she survived the sinking of the Titanic. But Harper turned around. Uh, he actually, apparently, because he was a widower on his own, he was offered a spot on the lifeboat, but he actually gave it to somebody else and instead turned around and urged the band to play Nearer My God to Thee. And then he spent the last... Uh, hours or minutes on the Titanic, gathering people to pray. And I can't remember if they show that in the movie, but he would get, he gathered people on deck and did everything he could to urge them and remind them that God, God is near and that it's never too late to receive the forgiveness of Jesus. And so as the ship began to sink, John Harper jumped into the icy waters and continued even in the water to urge people to turn to Jesus. Four years after the sinking of the Titanic, um, the book, The Titanic's Last Heroes by Moody Adam records a meeting that took place actually in Hamilton, Ontario. And there was a young man there that night named Aguila who stood up and shared his story. And here's, here's what he said. I'm a survivor of the Titanic. When I was adrift on that awful night, the water brought Mr. John Harper of Glasgow on a piece of wreck near to me. Man, he said, are you saved? No, I said, I'm not, he replied. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then the waves bore him away. But strange to say, a little while later, they brought him back again. And he said, are you saved? No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am. He said again feebly, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And shortly after, he went down. And there, alone in the night, and with two miles of water underneath me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. No matter what you think about faith or believe about Christianity or Jesus, there's something about a testimony like that, that you have to respect. That John Harper died with a conviction that death actually was not the end of things. He died believing that God had come near to us, that nearer my God to thee, that God was near. And he believed it with firm conviction to the very end that God has been made 
not only possible to receive salvation, but incredibly accessible. That salvation is literally only one prayer away at the end in the waters. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And of course, that's a quote from Scripture, Acts 16. John Harper died with that conviction that the grave has no power over those in Christ. That there's newness of life, eternal life, because the path to God has been cleared for us. This is what Easter's all about. It's what Easter's all about. When Jesus died, it says in the scripture we're about to read, the curtain of the separation in the temple that separated the presence of God in the most holy part of the temple and the rest of the temple was torn top to bottom. That because of Jesus' sacrifice, now the path had been made for God to be brought near to us. That he was accessible. That the brokenness and sin that barricaded us from the presence of God had been paid for in full. And the path to his presence was paved by mercy and grace for us. And so with that, we're going to read Jesus' last words from the cross as he died. In Luke 23, picking up in verse 44. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The word of the Lord. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And of course, you know that up until this point in the story, Jesus has actually been in the hands of a lot of different people. Actually, it's a theme in the scripture, especially in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus is constantly being handed over, continually. The Greek is paradidomai. He's literally being paradidomied over and over and over again. So he's handed over by Judas to the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. Then the Sanhedrin hands him over to Pilate. Then Pilate hands him over to Herod. Then Herod hands him over back to Pilate. And finally, Pilate hands him over to the executioners. And so Jesus is constantly being handed over. And by these hands, they beat him. And with their hands, they bind him. And with their hands, they crown him with thorns on his brow. And with their hands, they whip his back until it's raw. And with their hands, they nail him to the cross. Many hands have abused Jesus. But in this last statement, Jesus tells us that it is not their hands that determine what his life will accomplish. Not the hands of men that will determine what his life will will accomplish. He actually told his followers in John 10 that nobody takes my life from me. I give it up freely. They do not control the circumstances of what's happening. These hands do not have power over him. Jesus chooses on the cross to commit his spirit into the only hands he trusts, the Father's. And then he breathes his last. And we get this remarkable response from the centurion, which I want to think about a little bit right now. It's remarkable because we're told he sees what's happened and he glorifies God. He praises God. Doxadzo is the, is the Greek word. Glory. He, he glorifies. He praises God based on what he's seeing. And this is significant because the centurion is, is, is a kind of like a neutral party in the whole thing. He's not on somebody's side. He's not a Jew. He's not somehow, he's just there doing his job. In fact, we know that this centurion, it's called, it says the centurion. This is an officer. It's his job, actually, to make sure the crucifixion happens properly. He's the guy on duty. He's the guy in charge of the whole scene that's happening. And so a centurion would have been in command in typically 80 to 100 Roman soldiers. So this isn't just like a new Roman recruit or an untested, like, you know, uh, new, new soldier who signed up yesterday. This is a seasoned veteran. Cold, calculated. He's been to a lot of killings. He's been to a lot of crucifixions. 
It's his job. He's the man in charge, and he's overseeing it. Cold, calculated, efficient, and pragmatic. He would have to be to be an officer in the Roman Empire. Yet by the end of the scene, he has seen righteousness in the death of Jesus. Luke has this theme in the whole gospel, we're in Luke, of people seeing things but not seeing things. And so people are seeing stuff that happens, but they're not actually understanding what's happening beyond just what's in front of their eyes. And so Jesus actually explains to his disciples earlier in the, in the gospel that he teaches in parables on purpose. He says in, in chapter 8, I teach in parables so that seeing they may, might not see and hearing they might not understand. And then he's opening literally the blind eyes of people in the story, and yet in the next story, people don't understand or can't see what he's talking about. We see Zacchaeus can't see him, so he climbs a tree. It's over and over. There's this idea of seeing in sight and then not actually seeing what's really taking place. And Luke is telling us here at the crucifixion scene, the centurion sees. He gets it. He understands that to be in Jesus' presence, even in Jesus' dying moments, is to be in the presence of the righteous one, in the presence of God himself. And he declares, surely he is righteous. And Mark and Matthew add, say that he also said, surely he is the son of God. And we see in verse 44 that the sky darkens. So what's that about? <laughs> is that just adding to the good storytelling? Like, is that foreshadowing? Why is the sky darkened in the story? Well, we know, actually, that it's not just to add drama, because Luke tells us in chapter 1, his purpose in writing this entire thing is to record history. He's telling the events as they've happened, according to eyewitnesses. That's what he set out to do. It says so in chapter 1. This is what happened according to the eyewitnesses. The sky darkened. So he's not adding like dramatic storytelling here. This is what happened. So what is it about then? Why did darkness fall when Jesus died? Well, we know that over and over in the Old Testament, that when the Old Testament describes the day of judgment often called the day of the Lord, the day when God's justice will be done on sin and brokenness in the world, the great and terrifying day of the Lord, sometimes called the day of judgment, the day of justice. It's the day when God enacts his righteousness. Whenever, when that's talked about in the Old Testament, over and over and over, it's prophesied that it will be a day of darkness. Joel 2.31, the sun will be turned to darkness before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1.15, a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Amos 8 verse 9, on that day I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I could go on over and over, there's lots, but what is Luke telling us? This is the answer to all the riddles, the answer to everything that's been prophesied already. This is the judgment day before the judgment day. The darkness is coming down on Jesus. The eternal justice of God, the great and terrible day of the Lord, is coming down on Jesus. The judgment of God that destroys evil and demolishes it is coming down and destroying him and demolishing him. He was judged so that judgment doesn't fall on us who believe. The centurion realizes in this whole conflict that's playing out, the whole uproar that Jerusalem's been in for the past week around this Jesus character, he realizes that it's not actually the religious establishment that are the righteous ones. It's not Pilate who's righteous, who's the righteous one. It's not the Roman Empire who's the righteous one. Even he, the centurion, is not righteous. Just doing his job, standing there, realizing hammer in hand that he's just crucified an innocent man. There's only one righteous one. And he was there on the cross. And all of us stand like that centurion at the foot of the cross, hammer in hand, having driven in the nails by my sins, my shame, my guilt, only to realize that he's up there for me, that he did it for the centurion, that he did it for me and for you. 
the day of darkness, means that if you receive him, you are as free from the penalty of your sins as if the penalty has already been paid. Because it has. The darkness has fallen on him, so it will not fall on you. We are the ones who deserve to be cast out, but because of this day, we're brought in. Nearer my God to thee. He's near. And it means that we too can actually pray this prayer alongside Jesus. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I place my life. And not just at the end of our life either, all throughout our life. I can live from that posture. That the death and resurrection of Jesus means that we have an invitation to place in God's hands whatever it is that is burdening us or condemning us or holding us back in bondage. That that can be placed into the capable hands of the Father. We can pray this with Jesus. Eugene Peterson says this. Because Jesus prayed this prayer, so can we. We will never know what Jesus experienced, nor will we ever go through the depth of what he experienced. But because of Jesus, even when we are at our worst, in our deepest struggle, we can pray this prayer like him. When we come up against darkness that doesn't quit, death that steals our life, we can choose to trust in God, to say, Father, I trust you with my life. It was a prayer of unquestioning trust, readiness to leave everything in the hands of the Father. We've been taking my daughter Iris to gymnastics lately. She's four years old, um, and so she's been practicing very hard. She's doing very good, but we, we decided to put her in gymnastics, and she was excited to participate, so we drive her there. It's kind of the first classes she's ever really done. But she has a teacher and a little class, and they do very limited gymnastics, I will say, for four-year-olds. But uh, <laughs> they do gymnastics, and one of the things they have to do is they have to learn to start hanging from the bar. And so it's pretty high because, like, they just have the one bar for adults. So they put a bunch of pads, but the little kids are kind of like they walk up these stairs and then they hang from the bar and they practice and she has to, like, lift her feet up to try and touch the bar with her feet. And so I had brought her um, and I was watching from the sidelines as she's doing this and the, the teacher, it was, <laughs> I kind of felt bad for the teacher because the teacher was very carefully helping her kind of hold on to the bar and was watching her, and then like some other kid screamed, and right as she like looked like this, <laughs> Iris fell and dropped uh, onto the pads. She was there's still pads, but she had like bit her tongue on the way down. It was quite a hard fall, and so she's crying, she's screaming, and uh, it was uh, quite. She was quite upset about it. Well, and I did, of course, what any any father in this room would have done for their child. I ran to her side. I came near to her, and I picked her up in my hands, and I comforted her, and I held her until she felt that embrace and was able to recognize it. And then, of course, the next thing we did is we tried again. And so <laughs> she's a little nervous now, of course. She actually has this little mantra she says. I don't know. What does she say, Iris? Alice? She's, I'm brave. I'm strong. I can't do it. I'm brave. It was really quite cute. Takes a deep breath and closes her eyes. I am brave, I am strong, and I can do it. So anyway, so <laughs> but you could tell she was still very nervous, because obviously, and she had just bit her tongue and was bleeding. And, but she was determined to try again, so she got out of the bar. But she said this time, I'm nervous, she says, Daddy, will you catch me? And I said, yes, of course I will. I'll catch you. So we lift her up onto the bars, and she holds on. I'll catch you, Iris, if you fall. This prayer means that you have a good father today. A good father with hands outstretched, waiting to catch you, waiting to hold you when you fall. That you can trust his hands because of his deep love for you. He really can. And Iris is hanging there. And, of course, the next thing you know, she says, help, help, I'm falling. <laughs> help, catch me. And, uh, of course, I'm right there beside her. Like, I'm actually behind her. So she couldn't see me. She, couldn't, she didn't know necessarily. Was, am I still there? 
She said, just help, catch me. And I actually said, Iris, I can't actually catch you unless you let go. <laughs> she's white knuckling there. She's holding on desperate for the, still that, I got to hold on, I got to hold on. And I said, I can't actually catch you unless you let go. And I was reminded of how many times we just white knuckle our way through life, holding on to things with the tightest grip we possibly can, stressed out of our minds, trying to hold on just a little bit harder, a little bit longer, hold on to a little bit more, try to control a few more things in my life so I can feel secure. But all that ends up happening, of course, is that we feel more and more stressed, more and more anxious about it. And Jesus is inviting us to put into his hands, to release, to surrender all of it into his hands, his capable hands, the things that we've been trying to hold on to for so long, that into his hands you can commit your life, that it's time to hand it over, and that you're handing it in to good hands. Amen? His hands are good hands. His hands have been bound and nailed so mine can be free and healed. We are in good hands. Good hands in the storms of life. Good hands even when other hands have hurt you. Good hands, even when your own hands fail you. Good hands that uphold you when you cannot stand another day. Jesus, in his most desperate moment, ran into the hands of the Father. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. And so I don't know what's going on in your life today, the anxieties for tomorrow that you might have, or the troubles of the past that haunt you. But I do know that when you commit your life to Jesus, you're in good hands. The only hands capable. John 10, Jesus says in verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will be able to snatch them from my Father's hands. You're secure in his hands. And in this time of uncertainty and the troubles of the world and all the stresses, the resurrection of Jesus gives us good news that our own personal failures cannot undo the faithfulness of Jesus on our behalf, that our failed human systems that we built cannot thwart the love of God and his plan to renew the world, that the resurrection of Jesus is the good news that something cosmic happened that day, that Jesus opened up a new future for us and for all of creation, that you can experience true freedom, the kind of freedom that robs the grave, the kind of freedom and hope that death can't even steal. Jesus knew that his body was going to the grave, but his spirit would live, and that death was not the final word. Because we know the cross wasn't the end to the story, was it? <laughs> Early Sunday morning, he rose, rose from the grave. Death could not hold him. And this is the hope that we have, that Jesus is Lord over sin and death, and it has no hold. And so you and me are freed now, completely free, to release into hands and to live boldly and courageously, even in the face of great struggle, in the face of great disappointment, in the face of the hands of others who have hurt us, in the face of the things and our failures that we've done. That even in the face of death itself, like John Harper on the Titanic, we can know God is near. And you can trust his hands, for Christ has already overcome the grave. And so the words of John Harper are true today. Are you saved? God has made it so accessible to experience the salvation and to be near to him. There is literally nothing to be done, nothing you can do to actually receive it. It made me think of the, it's just, it's just finished, absolutely finished. It made me think of like anything you try to do actually detracts from it. It's like if you, I like woodworking, so I have this big canoe that I've refurbished and I've redone. And I, we had it here for an MPC thing that you probably, that some of you were at. But like I put a lot of work into that. I did it. I completed it. At some point I varnished it up and I said, it's done. It's finished. <laughs> now, if people were there and they said, oh, this is a wonderful canoe, but then they broke, brought up, broke out some sandpaper and, they, and a saw and they started, well, I think I'll add some things here and there to kind of fix it up and, and finish it. Like, no, what are you doing? It's done. It's finished. Like, anything you do now on top of this is actually taking away from it. And so Jesus on the cross, when he says, it is finished, it is actually finished. 
which means it paves the way for you to now say that into your hands, oh God, I commit my life, and that's all you need to do to experience the freedom and grace that's there because of what Jesus has done on the cross, that you can commit your life to him, and it's only one prayer away to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Acts 16, and you are saved. Romans says, confess, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you'll be saved. That's all that there is to do. And so, would you do that if you haven't? <laughs> would you commit your life, all of it, to surrender it over to him? To commit is to surrender. It means entrusting fully. Some versions say commend. I commend my spirit. It means to place in front of someone. To surrender all. To commit your life into his capable hands. To commit your family. To commit your marriage. To commit your children, your future hopes and dreams, your plans, your pursuits, your accomplishments. Commit them to him your finances, your past struggles, your pain, your woundedness, your bitterness, your illness, you can commit it to him. All of it can be committed to him. Whatever it is that you need to hand over today to the Lord, you can trust he will catch you. His hands are good. The old hymn says, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I give it all to you. Today can be the day of salvation. And again, I don't know where you're coming from today or why you're here this Easter Sunday. But this is something that I've experienced firsthand, and it's the testimony of people around you everywhere in this room. That when we have made that leap of faith <laughs> and actually trusted the hands of the Father and given our lives to Him, that we've actually seen that difference in our life, that we put it on the wall. When you encounter Jesus, it leads to transformation in your life. It's the testimony of people here in this room that it's actually real and it's actually true. And that his hands are capable for whatever is just overwhelming you today, that he can actually shoulder what you can't shoulder alone. He can bear what you can't bear on your own. That he can carry that with you and for you and beside you. And that you can yoke yourself to him. And so I'd urge you today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you. And so whether you have never committed your life to Jesus, that simple prayer, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. He will draw, the Bible says you draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You do that in your heart, he will answer that prayer. If you haven't done it, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that as I pray for you. And if you do know the Lord, but you've been carrying things for a long time, white-knuckling your way through it, trying to hold on to it with a tight grip, and the Lord has been saying, like, I'm right here all along. I'm ready to catch you. Would you release that too? You've given me your life. Now give me everything. Give me that thing you've been carrying. The Lord wants to bear that burden for you. That's his invitation. So I'm going to pray for you as well. When Jesus said that, I commit, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, he's actually quoting scripture there. Of course, at the end of the crucifixion, you can imagine he doesn't have much energy or ability to say a lot of words. So he says, it says in a loud voice he said these words, but really he's reflecting on Psalm 31. And when scripture is quoted like that, we're actually urged to turn there and consider the whole psalm. And so this is really what Jesus, uh, this is the broader context of what he's praying. And it's a prayer that he invites you to pray to. This is Psalm 31, verse 1. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your hands are at work in the midst of it all. There's a lot of hands there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of things going on in the lives of the people in this room. 
that I don't know about, Lord, but you surely do. You know the burdens we're carrying. You know the problems we're facing for tomorrow. You know the things that have kept us up in the night this week. And Lord, you have had your capable hands outstretched towards us for a long time. And so, Lord, we're ready to surrender it to you, to give it into your capable hands, and to say, deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Would you be faithful, Lord, in taking those burdens? And we know, Lord, even if we can't see you at work, even if it's a really dark circumstance, even if it's a really difficult problem we're facing, we can't see where you're working we can't see if you're there or hear you, Lord. We know that the hands of the Father have never failed and that you are there in the darkness. Your hands are at work, even in the darkness of the tomb that led to Resurrection Sunday. So we ask, Lord, that your hands would lead to resurrection, that we would be able to trust into your hands the things that we've been carrying. And, Lord, that we would commit our life to you if we haven't done that before, Lord, we confess our sins and say, Lord, we need you. We're broken. We failed. Would you forgive us, Lord? Would you receive us into your kingdom? Would you help us to believe on your name, to confess that you are Lord and to receive eternal life today? Thank you, Lord, for this amazing gift of Easter, the resurrection. Thank you that God has been brought near to us. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Don Falk to come up, and he's going to uh, play a song that really retells the Easter story, but I'll, I'll let him kind of uh, give his intro for that. In the meantime, I just wanted to say, if you've prayed today or if you want to know more <laughs> about what God is asking of you, <laughs> to surrender your life to him, or what it even means that if you just prayed that, what does that even mean? Uh, you want to know more about it. I, pr I ask you, like, talk to me before you leave, or talk to somebody next to you that you came with, um, or contact me too. You can do that online if you feel that's safer, but there's also people praying for you here, and so uh, we've been praying for you all morning, and if you want to receive prayer, if you came with burdens, so you don't know what it looks like, you just need to release it, you need some prayer for it, um, I would urge you, come to this corner over here after the service and we'll be, we'll be praying. Uh, yes, um, take us up on that invitation. If the Lord's stirring in your heart, don't leave today before you respond to what he's been doing. And with that, we'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Don. Don Francisco, he recorded an album in 1984 called Holiness, and on that album, one of the songs he recorded it told of the trial, the crucifixion, and the burial and resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> it's a timeless song, and it reflects the gospel accounts of the history of that first Easter season. And this year it became my devotional song through the season of Lent, and now Easter week. And as I kept playing it and rehearsing it, I, I arranged and adapted it somewhat for solo guitar. And as Troy and I chatted briefly about the song, we wondered, was it written from the perspective of uh, Joseph of Arimathea or, or Nicodemus? And it could well be. And, and there are also hints that maybe Thomas or Peter are part of the narrative. And, uh, and yet, how would it be if we include ourselves in the story uh, had we been there? that first Easter season. So I'd ask you to journey uh, with me as we experience the Easter story. And the ending of the song has a profound and joyous conclusion that begins with Jesus is risen. And so I'd love to have you at that point stand and join me in singing a chorus at the end as we conclude this Easter Sunday service and this Easter season. And the song is called Open Your Heart. Um, 
and I forgot to change, turn the lyrics, get to the lyrics, and I believe me, uh, the song is fairly lengthy, so it's <laughs> kind of hard to remember all of them. We'll try again. My story isn't a one of faith, it's one of doubt and shame, and the cowardice fear of men will bring. Through all his tribulations, I never dared to take a stand, though all the while I knew he was the king. Almost all the others on the council had agreed, but I thought that all the threats were only talk, till they began to speak of murder. In the end, I had to leave when they asked me which disciples could be bought. Early in the morning, I was wakened by the shouts when a man ran through the courtyard down below in a panic shouting, Jesus has been taken and the council's been convened and they're going to try to kill him now, I know. No one who'd been seen with him even knew about that trial. When I arrived, there was just an empty hall. When I finally found him, I could not believe my eyes. He was being scourged before them all. The crowd cried out for murder, but he never made a sound. And at last they led him back inside the door. When Pilate brought him out again and said, Behold, the man couldn't hold the tears back anymore. He bore no resemblance to the one I used to know. From his face you couldn't tell he was a man From the beatings and the lashings And the thorns upon his head He stumbled and he almost couldn't stand Pilate wanted to release him But the crowd just screamed and roared Until at last he let them have their way And they took him out to Golgotha And I followed far behind Afraid to look and afraid to turn away I Slowly I drew closer Till the light began to dim And a sudden silence spread across the land And at noon it grew like midnight as if no one were allowed to witness what was happening to this man. My God, my God, what have I done to turn your back on me? His scream of anguish echoed down the hill. And it seemed to her the misery and the sickness and the sin of every man who ever lived never will. And in agony he raised himself and he pulled against the nails Just enough to fill his lungs for one more cry It is finished, Father, unto you And I'll commit my life And he breathed his last And he bowed his head And he died
Before the sun had set, we took his body from the cross and we washed it of the gore of all his wounds. And we wrapped him in the linen and the spices that we'd brought. And then we rolled the stone across the tomb. Well, at first it was the women, then Peter said so too. Then two more came from Emmaus in the night. And then he himself was standing there, and his glory filled the room. And the darkness in my soul was filled with light. When he turned to me, it seemed the others disappeared. And he touched me, and I saw his hands inside. And the words he spoke to me alone drove all my fears away and lit a fire that's burning deep inside. And then he told us all as God sent me, I am sending you to destroy the work of Satan and to preach. I preach deliverance to the captive and the gospel to the poor that heaven has come down within their reach so now as he's commanded i'm here before you all with a courage that i know is not my own to tell you that he's risen jesus is the lord and salvation now is in his name alone jesus is risen and the battle is done yield to his spirit worship the son and take his forgiveness let healing start Jesus is Lord now open your heart yes Jesus is risen and the battle is done and yield to his spirit worship the son and take his forgiveness let healing start jesus is lord now open your heart Jesus is Lord now, open your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks so much for coming, and as usual, like an invitation, next Sunday, 10 a.m., we do this every week. <laughs> and of course, uh, come for prayer, like I offered. I'd love to talk to you, or we'd love to have somebody pray for you. For the rest of you, a wonderful, wonderful Easter season. Grab a coffee, tea, talk to somebody next to you, and he is risen. Oh, yes, Denver. Oh, yes, and we have some buns there for sure to grab one with your coffee. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.